Welcome to the 11th annual Ruckles House Circle Luncheon. The Ruckles House family is really proud to be serving as the presenting sponsors for this year's event. We really wish we could be gathering with you all in person, but it looks like we will have to wait just a little bit longer for that. As a member of the Ruckles House Center's advisory board, I know it wasn't an easy decision to move the event online again. But I also know we will soon be hearing about the center's learning lessons from COVID-19 project, and that some of those key lessons are about being flexible, adaptable, and resilient. So it's no surprise that the center is doing all those things in response to con changing conditions to create a great online event. The Ruckles House family welcomes you to this year's center luncheon, without lunch, unfortunately. When Bill reached out to Washington State University and the University of Washington, he had a vision of accomplishing in his adopted state what he had helped accomplish at the University of Wyoming. And that was a university-based center where diverse interests could set aside the common win-lose polarizing approach to public policy making and using the superior faculties of these distinguished universities and adding an advisory board drawn from across the political spectrum, the center works to achieve consensus solutions to complex public policy challenges. Bill left us in 2019 in the certain knowledge that this center had become and would remain a trusted resource for addressing and solving such complex issues as those of the environment, natural resources, disaster recovery, public health, and many others. And now the center is moving confidently into the next generation of its work. As longtime director Michael Kern retires, hmm. He has made a successful handoff to interim director Phyllis Schulman, which is exactly what I'm going to do right now. Phyllis? Thank you, Jill and Mary, and to the entire Ruckelshaus family for serving as presenting sponsors of today's virtual Ruckelshaus and Luncheon. I'm Phyllis Schulman, and I have the great privilege of serving as interim director of the center while the universities and the advisory board search for the center's next permanent director to really build on the amazing work that Michael Kern did during his 12 years as director. As a member of the center's core faculty and staff, I can tell you the center is in dedicated and loving hands while that search process is going on. I would also like to take a moment to thank our other very generous sponsors. Our premier sponsors, Costco Wholesale, Lynn and Jerry Grinstein, Perkins Coie, and the World Justice Project. I also want to thank our lead sponsors, JP Morgan Chase, Sally and Warren Jewell, Kongsgard Goldman Foundation, Linda Nordstrom, University of Washington, and Washington State University. I would also like to thank our sustaining sponsors and our supporting sponsors, whose names you see on the screen. Thanks again to all of our sponsors. Your support of our work makes such an enormous difference in what we are able to achieve. And I also wanna give thanks to a very special group, the people this event is named after and dedicated to our Ruckel Cells Circle. This unique group of leaders understands the importance of the center being stable, flexible, and independent. If you are a member of the Ruckel Cells Circle, thank you for your commitment. Thank you for your dedication to the center and the future of our state and our region. If you're not a member, we encourage you to join or renew your membership in this special group by considering a gift of $1,000 or more today. And I also wanna thank the center's advisory board, a remarkable group of leaders from every sector and every corner of the state of Washington. Among other benefits, the board helps us to make informed choices about what projects we take on. A great example of that is the way the board members rolled up their sleeves during the first year of the pandemic 
to consider how the center could bring its unique talents and attributes to identify lessons being learned by the COVID-19 response and recovery in Washington. And here to talk about the project that resulted from that collective commitment is Benjamin Wilson, Director of Strategic Execution for the Kaiser Health Plan Foundation of Washington. Welcome, Benjamin. Thank you, Phyllis. Uh, as Phyllis mentioned, I serve as Director of Strategic Execution for Kaiser Permanente's COVID-19 division. We knew we'd have one of those. Uh, it has been nearly two years since the World Health Organ Organization officially declared the novel coronavirus a pandemic. The world we knew then is not the world we know now. Uh, it changed and all of us have changed with it. The response to COVID-19 in our state is marked by many incredible successes. For example, as of yesterday, 80.2% of residents five and older or 5 million people are fully vaccinated in this state. That is a landmark achievement and we should all be very proud of it. Our response has also created an unprecedented opportunity to evaluate how we interact and lead. Uh, it has highlighted a need for improved cross-sector collaboration and governance, the need for systems thinking approaches, and the engagement of diverse interests and perspectives for recovery and to prepare for new and reoccurring emergencies. That is why the Kaiser Foundation Health Plan of Washington was enthusiastic when we learned about the Ruckel South Center's plans for its learning, learning from responses to COVID-19 project and why we funded the first phase of this important work. The goals of phase one were to initiate a comprehensive learning effort that takes into account the lived experiences of people from multiple sectors and identify lessons learned from our COVID-19 responses. We aim to use those lessons to create new approaches and solutions that address both new and long-standing challenges and to apply race and equity principles to address disproportional impacts across our diverse communities. During phase one, the center interviewed over 80 individuals to identify key areas of focus for the more comprehensive phase two learning efforts an impressive undertaking. Interviewees included directors of state agencies, business representatives, university leaders, healthcare organizations, funders, tribal leaders, nonprofit and economic development organizations, and more. Uh, as someone who works on COVID-19 response day in and day out, uh, I've appreciated the center's thorough and inclusive approach to this work. I value the type of questions the team asks, the way they ask them, and how they use their expertise to get introspective responses from such a broad range of partners. I'm also proud of the center's work to ensure that the approach and design of this project included a focus on race, equity, and social justice. As we move into phase two, there are opportunities now to look ahead, to re-envision public health as a public-private partnership, hardwire new emergency response frameworks for decision-making, rebuild our healthcare workforce with an eye towards diversity, invest in the resiliency of our small and medium-sized businesses and address systematic inequities and in how our communities access services. Let me paint a picture for you what it has and could look like for the future. Last spring, our Kaiser Permanente team was part of a multi-sector partnership with big businesses such as Microsoft and Starbucks to develop a public-private partnership to rapidly design a playbook for how to efficiently run mass vaccination sites. This playbook was used at the Microsoft campus at events across the state and country. Participating sites became the cornerstone of vaccination efforts in King County and beyond. King County Public Health ensured vaccine supply was in the right place at the right time and engaged with their community navigators to get the word out and connect with diverse communities. This partnership between corporate and public health leaders allowed our DOH to focus on providing similar services in other parts of the state with mass vaccination sites in Yakima, Spokane, and beyond. Because of our shared values, Washington State reached a peak of 50,000 vaccinations a day, rapidly changing our ability to live with this virus. The time that government, community, and corporate leaders have invested in this learning effort shows how important this work is to our collective growth in the future. I truly appreciate the work of the Ruckles House team and I thank those of you on the line today for your support of the Ruckles House Center. And now uh, I would like to turn things over to the Ruckles House Center Advisory Voice Board Vice Chair, JP Morgan Chase, Northwest President and Pacific Northwest Treasurer, Phyllis Campbell. Well, thank you so much, uh, Ben. And thank you, especially for your personal belief, but that of Kaiser Permanente Washington 
in the whole COVID response um, effort and the funding of phase one. It truly would not have been possible without your belief in our work. And thank you also to the entire team at Kaiser for what you just said was uh, and has been and continues to be incredible response uh, to our state's uh, long-term health care, I guess, infrastructure and response. So just a great big thank you from all of us. So I'm gonna to turn to all the rest of you who have joined us today and say, this is the pitch portion. And I, first of all, want to extend uh, a thanks to all of you who have supported the center. There are many, both corporate company, individuals, foundations who have been listed, but a number of you have continued to support us in a sustainable way. So I wanna say thank you for that. But the pitch really is this, uh, we get our core funding uh, from individuals and foundations and really uh, donations from the public. We only get 10% of our core funding from our great states research universities that have just been listed as our partners. So we really do need the support of all of you to continue the great work. And while I'm thanking all of you, I'm also saying that, you know, we need you to continue to be generous. So. A couple of things that I just say personally, I've been certainly engaged from the very beginning of the center by Bill's vision that Jill talked so eloquently about. And I think one part of that vision has come to reality in the fact that we have had an amazing number of complex and difficult projects and difficult situations that the center has been at the heart of solving. And so I'm very proud of that. I've watched it in action. But also personally, I really believe that now more than ever, we need that collaborative capacity muscle. And the center is really instrumental in helping us build that statewide, not just through projects, but through, as uh, Ben said so well, cross-sectoral partnerships and so on. So I really believe in the mission. As I say, it's needed more than ever. I hope you'll join us if you haven't already. And if you have, thank you. But one of the things that we are going to have throughout the event is your ability to donate during the event. So if you, um, a couple ways you can donate. One is you can text collaborate to 91999, which is on your screen. So you'll see that throughout the event. And I hope you take your phones out and just do that. Not check your email, but at least donate. We would appreciate that. And also, if you're on a computer screen, you'll see the words come across with the word donate. And you can click on that and uh, also uh, donate any amount. And any amount, by the way, large or small, is very much appreciated by all of us at the center. So again, thank you. Um, this is work worth doing. This is work that now more than ever we need in our state to improve our quality of life and really the future for our kids and grandkids. So thank you. So now it's my pleasure to transition to the next part of the program. And based on the book of the same name, the reunited States focuses on really what's at the heart of the center's mission individuals who have dedicated their lives to really bridging the racial and political divides and working on depolarization. So I don't think there could be a more timely topic. So I hope you enjoy the short film that follows. And then following that will be one of our esteemed advisory board members facilitating a discussion, Dr. Jody Sanford, who's the Dean of the Evans School of Public Policy at the University of Washington. So enjoy the film. Our country is very divided right now. Folks were physically attacking one another. The root causes of division go all the way down into our foundation as a country. I can't breathe! I can't breathe! Stop! Stop! If we're going to live in a democracy, all of us have to learn to be mediators and bridge builders. My daughter would tell you, let's get on to the issues that she died for. The divisions are happening in our neighborhoods, they're happening in our schools, and they're happening in our families. We decided to travel to all 50 states to get an understanding of what was causing these divisions. Issues we'll inherit are not so much dividing between the left versus right, but really the future versus the past. We decided to create the first ever caucus for young members of Congress. 
I want to create a third force in our politics that's able to get us beyond this partisan warfare. Meeting people across the country who have a passion to see our divisions heal, that gives me hope. Have someone look at me as if we don't deserve to be respected, we don't deserve to be treated fairly. It does something to you. We get uranium, we get murder, we get alcohol. Nobody's doing nothing about it. I wish there was something I could do to help her. I don't want other mothers to go through this. This country needs bridge builders. Don't be afraid to reach out to someone who might not believe exactly like you believe. Hi, everyone. My name is Jody Sanford, and as Phyllis said, I'm the Dean of the Evans School of Public Policy and Governance at the University of Washington. I've been here for a year, and in that year, I've learned an awful lot about this wonderful center that's a resource to all of us in the state of Washington. Um, and I've been particularly interested in this work because my own research focuses on the design of services and organizations to deliver more public value for everyday people. So I'm going to be facilitating the conversation today. and. Loved the little clip of the video. We had hoped to show it um, at the university, but obviously the COVID-19 Omicron surge made those plans different. So it's my pleasure now to introduce uh, the people who are behind that film and the book, uh, Mark Gerson, who is the president of the Mediator Foundation. And he's really worked to bridge partisan divides in the US for over 25 years. Um, he's worked internationally with the UN and the US House of Representatives, and he didn't just facilitate those discussions, he helped to start an initiative called the Bridge Alliance, which is a coalition of over 100 respected organizations that are committed to revitalizing democracy. Um, he also wrote the book, The Reunited States of America, How We Can Bridge the Partisan Divide. And for those of you who have not yet got it, I, I would encourage you to because it's really the catalyst for the film. Enrique is an award-winning narrator and documentary filmmaker, and he's worked with the Coen brothers and George Clooney. His debut feature film was an audience award winner called Waterborne, and his follow-up film, The Ashram, starred Academy Award winner Melissa Leo and Kyle Penn. He's doc co-directed documentary series it's for PBS, um, and The Re Reunited States is his documentary debut. Um, and it's executive produced by Van Jones and Megan McCain and was released a year ago. So what we hope to do today is use the power of technology to integrate this film with interactions with you. Um, we'd like to just let you know, we want to hear your questions and we want to integrate it into the conversation we're going to have. So you can see here, just text questions. Um, to that number and you will be able to offer them and they will get fed magically behind the scenes to me and I can integrate that into the conversation. Before I, I pass the baton to Mark and Ben, it's important to note, I think that the Ruckels House Center as a convener, right, is a, is a collaborative venture of people have said between the University of Washington and Washington State University. Um, and as those of you in Washington state know, Bill was a really principled leader who was skilled at bridging the kinds of ideological divides that are the center of this book and this film. In the film, they note that the US is grappling with a polarization in our hearts. And from what I've been learning about Bill, that would have pained him deeply. So Ben and Mark, um, I'd like to you to share, start by sharing a bit about what motivated you um, for this book and film? What's the nature of your collaboration and what impact has this had? Thanks, Jody. I'll start by just saying that, you know, I realize this luncheon without lunch is, uh, goes back at least a half a century. I mean, Bill Ruckelshaus started working in this cross-partisan way back in the 60s when I was growing up in Indiana. Um, Michael Kern's been involved in this for a quarter of a century. I've been involved in this for a quarter of a century. Um, 
I wrote a book called A House Divided back in 1996 that started talking about this splintering of our country. So we've all been looking at this issue for a long time, and uh, I'm, I'm delighted to be able to be together today because looking back the way I am, I, I realize that the seeds of this, this discord, the seeds of this disunity, um, they have deep roots, and then it's not going to be fixed overnight. And for me, the Ruckus House Center, is a, is a, it's a joy to be part of this because every organization in the country that's bridging divides is basically, I think, the key to the future of our country. Um, and I, I first felt the need to do this in an intense way in 2014 when I looked ahead to the 2016 election. And I said, Jody, you know, this is going to be one of the worst, most combative elections we've ever had in our country's history. And I wrote The United States of America. It was published in 2016. And it's had quite an impact over the years, um, including us being together today. But one of the most fortuitous impacts was that I got a call from this young filmmaker in L.A., Ben Rickey, who said, you know, hey, Mark, um, I'm thinking about making a film called The Reunited States. And I found out you'd written a book by that title. And so um, our collaboration has been a joy, Ben. And I, I just um, I just want to welcome you and say it's good to be on the on this stage with you. You too, Mark. I, uh, it's been quite a journey, and it's true, the title is what brought us together. Independently, we both came up with this thinking that it was too clever uh, and that someone must have used it, and I realized that Mark already had. Uh, so very excited to be with this group in particular, um, not just you know because of uh, the Ruckles House Center, which has paved the way for this kind of work to happen. Uh, you know, Mr. Ruckles House lived in and breathed this mindset, which is so desperately needed in our country right now, and the hard work that uh, that everyone in this organization is continuing to do to carry on that legacy. Um, and then also, you know, speaking to people in the Pacific Northwest who are oftentimes at the front of change and ideas and compassion, um, but also that there's a mix of uh, political beliefs, you know, uh, from urban to rural areas. So there's a particular interest we have speaking to this audience directly. Um, myself, uh, as Jody said, I'm a filmmaker. Um, and like many people after the 2016 election, found myself quite emotional. And whether people were angry or scared or excited about the outcome of that election, it really brought out an emotional response in all of us. And for me as a storyteller, I really felt compelled to find a way to use my work in media to help us emotionally move forward from where we were because it was tempers were flaring and people really felt scared. Um, and I, you know, media has been part of the problem of division and, you know, cable news and print journalism and especially social media uh, has really been used to fuel our divides because there's an incentive for advertisers to boost engagement. And they'll do that by any means necessary to get you to pay attention. And, and that usually means danger, danger. And so for me, as a person working in media, I realized it was incredibly important to make media part of the solution too, not just part of what ripped us apart, but part of what could mend us back together. And I was sort of searching for what that looked like and what that meant. And it wasn't until I was in DC uh, for an event, and I saw Susan Bro speak, who ended up becoming one of the subjects in the film. And as many of you know, Susan um, Weather Hire, who was killed in, in the Unite the Right rally when the car drove through the crowd in 2017. And I saw her give this speech where she said, unless we learn to have constructive conversations, we're going to only have more division and violence. And we need to learn to hear and speak across these divides and see each other's humanity, or we're going to end up right back here again. And it just hit me like a ton of bricks that here was someone who was on the front lines of division and had lost her daughter in this horrible tragedy very publicly. And if she was on the other side of trauma and could talk to us in a way that was like, here's the wisdom that I've learned through this journey, I, I felt compelled to say, I want to amplify this. I want to be part of bringing your story out to the world because so many of us are lost and emotional and you have this wisdom and you're a voice of reason in a time where there's not many of them. And so I, I, I came up with this idea for the title after talking to Susan, and that's what led me to Mark. And he's the one who introduced me to the three other stories in the film. So Mark, I'll, I'll pass it back to you for a moment before, uh, before we pick back up. Well, yeah, I, I'll build on that, Ben, and just say that I, I want to go back to what Benjamin Wilson said about fighting COVID and, and, and what the state of Washington has done, because 
I think it relates, people might think, oh, this is about politics. We're having a conversation. Well, we're really having a conversation about almost every issue that we face as a nation. Because the data has just shown that the key ingredient in fighting COVID, the countries that fought COVID most effectively are, are ones that have high trust in government and high trust between citizens. That's the key variable, not how big your hospitals are, not how smart your universities are, but trust. And I think that's what the Ruckus House Center and, and that's what our film is about. It's really about, it's, you can't have collaboration without trust. People who don't trust each other don't collaborate. And what COVID needed was a collaborative, coherent response. And that's only possible with trust. And one of the reasons we did so badly is because trust is so low in our country. So I feel that what we're talking about here at lunch and this, this conversation and what the center stands for is absolutely at the heart of the future of this country. We don't, we can't tell you the future, but since those of us have been working on this for 25 or in Bill's case, 50 years, um, this is, the future is really about, can we build, rebuild trust in our nation, trust in government and trust between citizens. To the degree that we do that, I think we'll solve many of the issues that the center and, and the nation is dealing with. If we don't rebuild trust, we're in trouble. And, and, it's, and it's hard to measure trust. You know, it's easier to measure money and it's easier to measure, measure pollution, but we don't know how to measure trust. And it's time that we really learn that because it, trust is really the key to what makes democracy work. If you have an authoritarian system, you don't have, tr you don't, it's not based on trust, it's based on fear. But we have a system based on trust. And, and that's what I love about the film, Ben, is that I think you, you captured that in the characters you picked. Every one of those characters is working to rebuild trust in America. And I think that's really kind of uh, what, what we're going to see in the theme of the questions we're about to hear from, from those and, and everybody what the center's doing. I think that's what really this is all about. And I, I, I want to honor you, Ben, for kind of looking through all the, the, the weeds and coming out and realizing this is really about people who rebuild trust, whether they're running for office or wh whatever their role is in society, they are trust builders, not trust destroyers. So thank you for that, Ben. No, thank you, Mark. And uh, I'm excited to get into the discussion in just a, just a minute here. Um, but just to speak on Mark and I's uh, you know, journey in this, Mark is considered kind of the godfather of the transpartisan movement. And you know, when I was just starting out, it was his wisdom in his book. And I encourage anyone who hasn't read it to read it because it's, it's a very introspective journey. And that's what struck me most. And the film, uh, for anyone who wants to see it, we released on Amazon and iTunes, and we just did a PBS run um, that played to 200 million people in January, uh, which was super exciting. But it's available on Amazon Prime um, if, you, if you'd love to watch it. I think if you need a little bit of hope about stories of people that are trying to work to find solutions, bring us together, they're not getting a lot of amplification. And that's why uh, I, I believe that Van Jones and Megan McCain uh, came on board is, is they, they recognize that these stories aren't getting the same kind of uh, spotlight as the more divisive media. And there is a lot of people in, the, in, in sort of the middle of the political spectrum that believe that we need to find to, to hear each other and move forward. And I'll just say, you know, for me, what people ask, you know, what did you learn while making this film? And it really is that division is an internal issue as much as it's external. And each of us carry with us political bias, whether we realize it or not. We might think, you know, if we're on the left or the, we're trying to save our country, that we're fighting for the greater good, that we're trying to save democracy and we're trying to defeat the forces that are trying to ruin it. Well, I'll tell you what, people on the other side think the same thing. And until we don't look within ourselves and examine our biases, if we're using language like, all those people or all of them that supported this guy, that in itself is a form of prejudice because we're dehumanizing entire groups of, of people without seeing their individuality. And what we're gonna do now is, is show a clip from the film because really what it comes down to, another, another kernel of wisdom that I had learned on this journey was we're only gonna change the course of our country one conversation at a time. There's no, there's no magic pill that will, that will fix democracy. And it's the human to human interaction with someone different than you, where you go in without prejudice, not trying to change their mind, but really listen to where they're coming from. And so the clip we're about to show uh, is from the film. One of the storylines is about a conservative family that decided to travel to all 50 states in an RV to find out what divides us. And what they discovered was very shocking to them and it was very personal to them. And so we're gonna show um, this incredibly powerful scene 
from the film and then we'll pick back up with the conversation. So we can go ahead and roll the tape. Generally speaking, um, I'd have to honestly say that I don't have a really great feeling towards white people. Um, a lot of it is because of some of my experiences and some of what I've seen my parents experience. Mm -hmm. I went into labor with my first child when I was seven months along. And my water broke while I was walking around the mall with my dad. He was buying baby clothes. Mm -hmm. And I went to the hospital. The nurse came in and I said, I think I'm having contractions. And she examined me very quickly and she said, oh, you're not ready to have this baby yet. You call me back in here when you're ready to have this baby. And they let me lay there for hours. By the time the doctor came, I was crowning. And my first baby died. And I know that they did not give me the care and the attention that I deserved. I lost my baby because they did not provide proper care for me. I'm so sorry. And it's so hard to know that I'm a good person, I'm a good mother, and to have someone look at me or to look at my children as if they're criminals, as if we don't deserve to be respected, we don't deserve to be treated fairly. It does something to you mentally and spiritually and emotionally. I've never forgotten losing my first child because I was a black, unwed mother. And they didn't think that my child's life was as important as the child being delivered in the room next to me. Michelle. So sorry. Let's get Still hurts. Wow, Ben. Really um, powerful human interaction between people, as you say, that are really different from each other. You know, I really, um, I really like the book and the film because I think you both are trying to remind people about what we know, which is that people are people. And part of what is so difficult these days is that larger forces are trying to um, make us forget that reality, I think, too often. And so just a real heartfelt question for you both. Um, you know, clearly we're really divided right now in terms of how we're responding to COVID-19. Um, you know, in the last week, what we've been seeing about the debates around lifting the mass mandates. Um, and, you know, we're, we're watching the continuing investigations into January 6th and insurrection. We're seeing attacks about the basic fast facts of our racialized history. We're witnessing you know, increasing challenges because of the climate change. And so it's fueling this kind of collective anxiety and pessimism. And so I guess I'd like you to reflect a little bit about how do you think those personal connections, like the one in this clip, like how is that part of the solution? And, and is the personal connection enough? I think the personal connection Jody is central, um, but you know what's the climate in our country now? Even if you put aside the pandemic, it's very hard for people to have personal connections across the political divide today because we tend to go into these bubbles. So that's where this question of courage comes in. You know, we're a, we we like to think of ourselves as a frontier people. We like to think of ourselves as explorers and 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 innovators. Well, one of the best ways we can explore and innovate is to get out of our bubble, and. Um, the kind of conversations that the Rutgers House Center has sponsored, the kind of conversations that the film is catalyzing, the kind of comments and, and, and conversations that the members of the Bridge Alliance, these organizations that are bridging divides, I think that what they're all doing is they're trying to say, how do we create environments where those personal moments can happen? And I really honor this couple that was in the film because they were a re Republican couple 
in Dallas, Texas, who happened to hear me on PBS one, or on, on NPR one day, and they literally sold their home, bought an RV, and said, we can't say we love this country if we don't know this country. <laughs> and they then went and traveled all 50 states, including yours. Um, so it's like, to me, that's courage. That's the kind of American courage. That's the kind of American patriotism we need right now. And, and they had a lot of those personal encounters. And I, I think they're essential. But we also need to have the institutional framework that makes those possible. Yeah, I would, I would echo Mark. Um, there's many levels to the vision that we're experiencing as a country, um, obviously in our government, uh, in our media, our institutions, our communities, our neighborhoods, and especially in our own families. When we talk about how deeply personal this is, all of us have family members that we vehemently dis disagree with. And it's really difficult because we see part of our identity wrapped up in that other person and it can be deeply unsettling to us to, to have them see the world so differently than we do. Um, I, and and I, I would go back to the idea that there's a difference between how we feel about our elected officials and how we can feel about each other. Um, you know, leaders, there's a different incentive at play for political parties to win elections. And that includes riling you up and getting you angry to get to the ballot box. So their goal is to win the election, not necessarily repair public good, or even solve problems because sometimes they need those problems to, to exist to fire people up to go to the ballot box. Uh, media, for example, another big institution, they're gonna show you the extreme 10% of voices on either side that get you so furious that you keep watching and because that's their advertising revenue that comes in, same with social media. And so the, the institutions that are, are, are fueling divisions are incentivized to do so. They're not, they're not here to repair how we work, function as a country and as a society. So the interpersonal relationships are extremely important because all we can really do is do what you can with what you have where you are. And that means in every day of your life, there's a decision. Are you gonna be angry at people you don't know and say all those people believe the election was stolen? How can they do that? Like there, there's a sense that people are suffering and they're looking for answers. And when you have someone that says, this is why you're suffering and this is the reason, I can't, I, I can understand why people would, would say, oh, this explains why I'm in this disposition. And on the left, when I was growing up, conspiracy theories were, you know, the Illuminati and on the right, it's now QAnon. And, and the same thing was this global elite is behind, you know, pulling these strings. And so I, I wouldn't give up on people that we disagree with. We in fact have to see with more compassion and actually have interactions that don't judge and don't try and change people's mind and bludgeon people with facts, but really with a curiosity just to understand where people are coming from because beneath our differences is our common pain. And that's what we have in common. So for me, it's all about starting there on these one-on-one -on -one interactions in every moment of every day, you have a decision to make. Are you gonna divide us further? Or are you gonna try and bring us back together? I appreciate that. And one of the things that I've been thinking about recently is that this division, which, you know, maybe as Mark said earlier, we're a country that hasn't had a high trust in government. I think we have had a high trust in each other in earlier periods. Um, you know, it's it seems to be spreading, right? So we suddenly have the trucker protests in Canada and the declaration there of you know, a national emergency, which hasn't been done in over half a century. And so I guess I'm curious about, is there something specific about the COVID-19 restrictions that are causing them to have an impact on North America and around the world? Like, is there something about this moment that we should better understand? Well, I think COVID-19 was the straw that broke the camel's back, but it, there was already, the stage was already set. The work that Bill Ruckelshaus and Michael Kern and I and others have been doing for years, we were doing that long before COVID. We identified the problem long before COVID. So I think COVID is the exacerbating factor. Um, I think underneath that is the fact that we are a very individualistic society that's based on individual freedom and that is based on a mistrust of government. That's kind of how we started as a nation. And I think it's one of the reasons why we're a great nation and why people come from all over the world. You know, they take risks to come from all over the world to come and be part of our, our, our American experiment. But what happens at the what happens when that fragmenting hap goes too far? I think is that what we're seeing. That's what we're seeing now, Jody. I think we're seeing that now. And and for me, COVID exacerbates that because it actually 
brings up this issue of trust in a way that, um, you know, I mean, the truth is school textbooks bring up the issue of trust. Uh, economic inequality brings up the issue of trust. Um, election laws and election rules um, bring up the issue of trust. So trust is already at risk in America. And COVID just made it made, basically made it, uh, you know, a, a, almost a life and death issue. And for me, it's, it is a life and death issue because we have lost lives in this country because of low trust. And, and you know, we haven't mentioned it, but, you know, this country could witness a war in Europe um, within the next week. And traditionally, Americans would pull together. We'd pull together because we'd say, well, we have to fight foreign enemies. We'd pull together because we'd say, well, we have to fight in a global economy. And what we're now like is, I mean, imagine if the, if the, LA, if, if the LA and Cincinnati teams at the Super Bowl had been divided against themselves. <laughs> a team that was divided against itself at the Super Bowl would have lost. And that's the position America's in. And, and the challenge I'll give to all of us, including the Ruckles House Center, is how do we re-inspire Americans to see we're on the same team? And if we don't, if we don't work as a team, we're going to lose militarily and we're going to lose politically and we're going to lose economically. And, and to me, it's, uh, it's so COVID brings it home. But I think it's, it runs through all of those issues, Jody. That's my, that's my impression. What about you, Ben? Yeah, I, I I do think that COVID has become a third rail issue, um, which is so unfortunate because it, it, at the beginning of the pandemic, it seemed like it would bring us closer together. Uh, you know, this brings me back to the idea of looking at what we have in common and, and trying to spotlight where there's hope. Um, you know, if you think about it, no matter where you're from, what kind of socioeconomic background, class, race, gender, we all kind of want the same things for our lives. We want a decent paying job. We want, you know, safe communities. We want a future for our kids. We just disagree on how to get there. And so there's probably thousands of policies that we actually would agree on, but there's five or six that we will never agree on, you know, and it's, it's, it's abortion, it's guns, it's climate. And now, unfortunately, it's COVID. And so rather than really focus on the issues that are dividing us, can we look at our common humanity and see, you brought up the trucker protest. You know, the, the flip side of that argument is we need truckers for our infrastructure. Our nation would fall apart. Every, if you bought it, a truck brought it. And, you know, they're spending a lot of time, they're working long hours on the road. They're by themselves. They're not interacting with people. Did we need to force them to do something to their public health that they didn't feel comfortable doing in the same way that we needed to with, hospitals or schools where there's actually large volumes of people and it affects a lot of other people. And and there, maybe their protest is saying, we're killing ourselves out here as frontline workers and you're imposing something on us that we don't feel safe doing. And so I, I think it's important to always understand where the other side is coming from. I'm not agreeing or condoning, I'm just trying to um, understand. But yes, it, uh, there are there are paths forward and, and you know, COVID is one of the toughest things because we have to look out for our family and who we care about the most. Um, but ultimately, it's hard to impose uh, on other people what we what we want to do for ourselves and our family. For those of you who are watching, um, remember, we're going to take questions from you. And so a question came in um, from the chat um, that that basically said, you know, We've been talking today about people who've been trying to build trust for 25 to 50 years. Given where we are, would you say they haven't succeeded? Or do you think we'd be in a much worse place without those efforts? Well, I think the question is very timely. And I've often said when people would say, well, why are you leading this meeting? I would say because I'm the biggest failure in the room. Um, because as, as, a, as, a, as a movement, uh, we have failed. I mean, look at is, is, is the Republican Party the party of Bill Ruckel's house? No, you know. Um, so we've, we've, we've all, we all have to look at it in the mirror and say, why isn't this working? And I think that's why I'm bringing us back to the issue of trust. Because most of us, you know, when we say, what are we doing? What's our career about? We say, well, we're a doctor or we're a lawyer or we're a politician or we're a professor. We don't say we're a trust builder. <laughs> and I think more and more of us have to start going, is what I'm doing with my life, is the way I'm making a living, is the way I'm conducting myself, am I a trust builder or not? Because I'm, I'm serious. Um, you know, we are all worried about climate change because there's a rise in centigrade, centigrade, and one centigrade and a half temperature rise, and they think that's gonna imperil the earth. I think the other thing that's imperiling the earth is this precipitous drop in trust. And so I think that's, Jody, if I said, what is the mistake that the movement has made? 
uh, the movement has, you know, has probably made the mistake of thinking that the changes are all on the outside. It's about gerrymandering. It's about campaign finance reform. It's about changing the primary structures. All of those are important. All of those structural issues are important. But underneath them all is this question of trust. And I think we haven't taken that seriously enough. And I think it's time we do so. Another question actually coming from the audience is, um, I think, directed to you, Ben, really, which is, in the film, you focused on a conservative family who learned to appreciate broader views and perspectives. And the question is, do you wish you also had a progressive family to follow who'd learned to appreciate conservative views and perspectives? It's a fantastic question. And, and yes, I do think it's, it's a really fair point um, that people have brought up. And of course, I, in retrospect, I think would have uh, even more balanced the film to have someone, you know, from the left journeying for, you know, towards the right to understand, uh, you know, where people are coming from with different political beliefs. Uh, the, maybe there's a sequel. <laughs> maybe we can go back and do the re reunited States. Um, but, it, you know, ultimately, uh, the film is watching people undergoing the transformation that we all need to undergo, which is the self-examination and the introspective look at our own political biases. We walk around with such a thick partisan lens that we view everything few, uh, and we don't realize necessarily that we're, you know, judging people or be, we, we are part of the problem. And I think that's a really tough moment to face for anyone who's on the left or the right is to, is to point the finger inside and say, I can't change other people. The only thing I can change is myself. And that maybe is my contribution to the greater good is readjusting my anger towards people I disagree with because that collectively is causing this hysteria. Um, but it's a really good point. And, and uh, Mark, maybe we should do the sequel. Well, and maybe we should. I just want to say that the Levertons made very clear uh, that they're not Democrats now. They said, don't think we're Democrats now. We're still Republicans. We're still, we're, we're still conservatives. So yes, they opened themselves to a broader view, but they would never say they'd become liberals. They would never say they moved left. They would say, we opened our hearts. They would say, we opened our hearts and we really can embrace the richness and complexity of our country now. And I wanna make that distinction. One of the things that I'm grappling with as I look at the book and the film together is that I think in the book, um, which you pointed out is a few years old, there's more um, attention, I think, to political reform work, right? And what institutional changes do we need to make? Whereas in the film, it is really at this personal level. And of course, it's not an either or. But I guess I'm curious about if either of you want to reflect at all about some of the, again, current events around, you know, RNC's censure of Representative Cheney and Kitzinger around the work of the the January 6th co commission, other things like how do the personal and the structural interrelate here? Well, I'll say something about the issue and then Ben, I think you, you need to say why you focused the film the way you did because I think the choice you made to focus on people, not systems was a wise one. But the connection for me, Jody, is that people behave according to the rules. So if you're playing touch football and somebody tackles you, they've broken a rule. But if you're playing NFL football where you can basically cause concussions and still get away with it, you're going to play football differently. And so that we have to look at the question of what are the rules of our system? And the rules of our system now, unfortunately, um, they're, not, they're not incentivized to work across the aisle. I'm going to tell you a story without naming the representative's name. I said, you know, why don't you, I said to a Republican, by the way, a Republican who voted um, to, 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 uh, to, to honor the results of the election who opposed Trump on that, but a Republican, a conservative Republican. I said, um, why don't you guys work together more with the Democrats? He said, we do. We do work across the aisle in the House of Representatives. You just don't know about it because we work, we work on issues where we don't, that don't involve a lot of money and where we don't get a lot of press. Then he said, and this is what I want everybody to hear, as soon as it involves serious money and as soon as we get press, we get a call from the speaker or the minority leader and says, stop it. Stop doing that collaboration. Um, there's an election coming up and we can't do more of that. So there's actually a systemic problem to our leaders following in Bill Ruckel's house's footsteps. There's a systemic challenge and they're not incentivized to do that. They're actually punished for doing that. And that's why I believe that the personal touch 
is, is great. The personal connection is great. Opening our hearts is great. But we have to change the rules so that people aren't penalized for opening their hearts. Yeah, I would wholeheartedly agree. I it, the film does follow an independent candidate running for governor, and you know talks about the third party politics. And one of the things that's important to point out is our founding fathers never intended us to to dis devolve into a two party system. The film opens with a quote from Thomas Jefferson about the two party system. It's never mentioned in the Constitution about political parties. And the, we used to have five political parties up until 180 years ago. And the fact that it's now binary, it's blue or red, it's yes or no, we've, it's, it's dangerous for democracy. And our, our founding fathers warned us about the moment that we're exactly in right now, which is a two-party system that's ripping this country apart. And so, yes, there, and, and <laughs> one of the, the only things that the, 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 the two parties disagree on everything except for one thing, which is let's keep everyone else out. Let's keep out any other party. And so how we how we do structural reform is critical in this moment. It shouldn't be let's just defeat the other guys because the pendulum will swing back next time. We're not going to get rid of half the country or half the politicians. We're going to have to learn to coexist. So maybe there's an arbitrator. Maybe there is a need for a third party or at least a different way of voting. And I think one of the most exciting, hopeful structural changes that's happening is ranked choice voting. And it's been passed in Maine, it's been passed in Alaska, it's passed in California, but you know, Maine, so this is a, so ranked choice voting is basically, uh, you vote for your top five in order, you know, number one, number two, number three, and then regardless of party, everyone can vote, it's not, it's not party primaries. And then if your top vote doesn't make it, it goes to your second vote. If they don't make it, it goes to your third vote. So there's no spoiler argument. Like you can vote for the outside, you know, third party person and not worry I'm, I'm, I'm ruining this election or I'm, I'm throwing away my vote. And it, I, it has a transformative effect. Perfect real world example. Lisa Murkowski, Republican from Alaska, Senator. Uh, ranked choice voting passed in Alaska in 2020. So now she's the only Republican senator that voted to impeach Donald Trump because she in a Republican state because she doesn't have to worry about being primaried out of her jo her job. It's the direct reason of ranked choice voting that freed her up from the voters' ire, where it's a fair fight in any election. She's going to be up against five other people. If you want her, you vote for her. Number one, two, three, four, and she wouldn't have had the strength to do that if there wasn't ranked choice voting. And so there are things that are happening that are afoot that are real reasons for hope, uh, taking campaign finance reform, taking money out of, of, out of politics, um, that we need to be focusing our energy on and that the parties are resisting and fighting, but we the people have the power to, to make these changes. And there's a lot of ballot initiatives for ranked choice voting this election year. So please check your states and, and your municipalities and, and, and support ranked choice voting. Um, we are about out of time. I. Um... I, I have one final question, which is I've been thinking a lot about history, right? And the reforms you're talking about, Ben, uh, you know, a lot of people are beginning to talk about those political reforms. But do you all get any sense of hope by looking at this moment in the larger historical arc? There, it's it. To be honest, you know, there are moments of hopelessness and despair that we all have. You know, when we when we look around and say, "How do we move forward from here? Where do we go?" Especially when it affects us every day, and there's such dysfunction and gridlock. Um, to me, where I find hope is knowing that I've changed as a person, and that we all have that capacity to, and we're all on that journey if we choose to. And so, yes, the structural reforms that are making a difference. And through the dark, what is it? The dawn is darkest before the, the, the day is, the night is darkest before dawn. Like we're in this period of massive societal shifts. We're still in the midst of the pandemic, the economy. We've now seen how many people are oppressed and how much racial injustice there is. And just uh, the adversity that we've all faced and are still facing this time, there's a labor shortage. Uh, there's a, there's a shortage of teachers. There's there's a shortage of hospital staff. Like we let's not let's not mince words. Every part of our economy is still getting squeezed. Our nation is changing, and through great change comes to me great hope and a chance that let's rebuild this better as as we move forward. So I do see hope. We're not out of the woods yet, and we might not be for uh, a while. But it's up to each of us to to do our part, and there's a responsibility of citizens to do that. So Joe, let me just add a quick word okay. if I can, just yeah. that. 
quick word about where my hope comes from is a friend in South Africa who said, um, my parents supported apartheid. Um, I worked in the anti-apartheid movement and my kids um, are completely interracial and I've got interracial grandkids. Um, and it's like, that's three generations, grandfather, parent, and, and children, grandparents, parent, and children. And so if that's possible in, in, around an issue like apartheid, it's, it's possible to hear that kind of change. We have to have the long view. We have to have the long view. And I think if you have the long view, there's hope. Thanks for this. It's been fantastic, Jody. You've been wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Ben and Mark. Um, I'd like to turn things over to the Ruckles Health Center Advisory Board Chair, Bob Drool, to wrap things up and take us out. Thanks, you guys. Thank you. Well, thank you, Jody, Ben, and Mark, for those insightful remarks and thoughtful, thought-provoking discussion. I think it's one of the best exchanges we've had at one of these luncheons. I want to thank you for taking the time to share with us your important work. I know our country will be better off when enough of us follow the example of the subject of your film and take concrete steps to reunite. I'm sure we can all see the significance of this work, and I hope that we all take it as a call to action. I know it is a call that the folks at the Ruckel South Center heeded a long time ago and will continue to pursue in their work to foster collaborative solutions to policy challenges. Thank you all once again to our sponsors, our Ruckels House Circle members, and everyone who attended today. If you purchased a ticket for the event and have not yet viewed the film, the virtual screening room will remain open through February 18th, and I hope this has spurred your interest enough that you will now do so. You will also be receiving a copy of Mark's book upon which the film is based. It's also not too late to make a donation, large or small, to ensure the center is where people need to help, need, who need help can come together to, to solve problems when they are ready to reunite. Have a great rest of your day, and we hope to see or hear from you very, very soon. Thank you for attending.